Hey everybody, Jason here again with GDT Basics, and today's video question line is on circularity and polar probes. So the origin of this question goes back to a video we did on circularity in V-blocks and the inherent issues we have with inspecting circularity or cylindricity or even runout with V-blocks. The comment was, your video mentions a polar probe or a TIR checker. It'd be cool if you included slightly more detail on those types of tests to educate people. Uh, you're in luck. I'm equally as nerdy, and I love this question, so I want to do a really good video on this to kind of show uh, how, from a high level, uh, these polar probes uh, actually inspect circularity or cylindricity. So to first recap here, this was the uh, one of the images from the video that we covered on V-blocks and the inherent issues that happen with V-blocks and why we can't always trust them down to a certain level of accuracy in order to inspect cylindricity or runout, right? Uh, you can see here the example on the left is a real world example of a tri-lobed cylinder. So this outside diameter sitting inside that V-block uh, and it's rotating around. Now, in order to truly check runout, or uh, cylindricity or circularity, you need to check the, um, the radial deviations of that surface back to its own axis, or in the case of runout, back to the axis that is created by the datum feature. Um, as you notice here, the axis of this outside uh, feature here, the outside diameter, that axis is actually kind of going up and down inside these V-blocks, and that's due to the unique geometry of the part we're inspecting and the V-block itself. It allows it to settle down inside there on those high points, and that does throw off our uh, total indicated reading here. The full indicated movement is not actually what we think it is compared to the real air of that surface. But I digress. The question was... Could you show more detail on how polar probes and runout checkers actually inspect this part and negate this sort of uh, issue? So for those of you that aren't familiar, this is sort of a uh, turn check, uh, a runout checker, if you will, uh, a machine that's highly calibrated and ready to check uh, runout, cylindricity, circularities to an extremely accurate level. Uh, this down here is uh, similar to a polar probe. Uh, you can see the, uh, the stylus or the probe coming in there to measure the part that's clamped into the uh, vice that's part of the machine. So this machine is going to rotate this part in that vice or chuck, uh, and it's going to uh, measure the radial deviations with this probe. So again, like I mentioned, I'm going to talk about this from a bit of a high level because obviously I don't know how every one of these uh, machines work uh, in their own algorithms. Um, some have different plans of attack to, uh, to address this and measure this, but at the end of the day, they're all trying to accomplish the same thing. They're trying to map the surface so a computer can apply some sort of algorithm to understand uh, the error that is happening with that surface. So one way that we can do this is the machine knows its own center, right? It can calibrate to its own zero, zero, zero. If these are the jaws of our um, chuck, we can see that we would know the center of that chuck. Uh, the machine would easily be able to figure out where it's at, right? Where the zero, zero, zero is. So if the machine knows where that zero, zero, zero is, and we bring a probe in, and we touch the surface, right? If we touch the surface right here, we could know exactly where that point on that surface is. And in fact, it's probably something like 0.756 in the X and zero in the Y if we come in directly at the zero, zero, zero. So if we know where this point is at, uh, we know exactly where one point on that surface is. Now that's one small step into mapping the entire uh, cylindrical surface or cross-sectional elements if you're doing circularity. However, we can rotate this uh, and clock that. So we know at zero degrees, it was 0.756. If we rotate 20 degrees down and take another measurement, this one might exist at 0.751 and zero and Y, obviously. Uh, so we can see at 20 degrees, we get 0.751. So we're starting to get these polar dimensions to map out where all the points on this surface are. And if you're interested in turning these into quarter dimensions, it's just a lot of trig, but you could easily understand the X and Y location of this point as you rotate it around, right? And so we can take a bunch of points. At 40 degrees, we see the point is at 0.753. And so we can gather a bunch of points as we rotate this. And so we can begin to gather enough points to understand what the surface itself looks like as far as the form is concerned. So we have these three points, but we can gather quite a few points if we rotate at 20 degree increments all the way around this part and record the 
polar dimensions, right? The polar locations of each one of these points. And again, if you want to convert those all to uh, coordinate dimensions, it's just a little extra trig. Um, but really what the polar probe is doing and the, the turn checks uh, in some sort of way, either using a probe or a laser, they're tracking that entire surface, a lot of points, right? Very quickly and very easily. They're tracking where all the elements of that surface go uh, in, in, in any sort of direction from the center of the machine. So if we know the location of each one of these points with respect to the center of the machine, what the machine can do is apply some sort of algorithm. Now there's a lot of algorithms out there, there's a lot of methods, there's a lot of math to be involved to applying a best fit circle. One of those is the least squares method, uh, and that essentially creates a best fit circle where the area outside of the circle equals the amount of area of the inside of the circle. So what does that really mean? So we're going to draw a best fit circle. That best fit circle can be up over here. It can be down over here. Uh, it can be small. It can be big. It can be all those things. So it's going to iteratively apply these circles until it finds the best circle, the best fit circle. And that's where the area outside that circle. So these three areas. So if you add those three areas up and they equal the area inside the best fit circle, uh, these three areas here, uh, if those areas equal each other, then we have a least squares method best fit circle. So now if we have a best fit circle, the next step in order to understand, let's say circularity, is to measure the highest point with respect to that circle and the lowest point with respect to that circle. So here we see the highest point, right? The point that deviates the most away from that circle. And we also have the point that deviates the most the other direction, right? The lowest point from that circle. If we were to add up that value, those radial distance between each other, uh, the, the distance between those two points would equal the circularity. So again, this is a real high level way of picturing how uh, those polar probes or those turn checks are able to understand the amount of circularity error uh, with respect to the feature itself. Now you might be asking yourself, how is this not just run out, right? How can, why can't I just put this part uh, into a chuck and then rotate it and put an indicator on it and measure the full indicated movement? It seems like that's exactly what we just showed you there, the high points versus the low points, and you're not far off. The problem is with a run out check like you see here, this is taking into account locational error. So if we were to rotate this part over here, uh, when, when our indicator hits this low point here versus this high point here, that's a pretty drastic change in radial deviations, right? When in reality, the actual amount of circularity is probably less than that. So let's go through this part here and we'll see that it's clearly offset. So maybe we grabbed onto a different part in the shaft or the, the part we're inspecting, we grabbed onto a different feature and we started rotating this feature. But we are interested in the circularity of this feature, not this feature. So we can see here, if we bring our probe in and we take a point, we know where that's at laterally from our zero, zero point on our machine. So 0.693. Now, if we rotate it again, we can take another point, 6, 0.699, and we can rotate it again, 0.691. We're beginning to map, again, the surface of this entire feature, right? But if we know where the points are that make up that surface, we're able to then map out all of the points. And so we can track a bunch of points. Again, this is using a computer, so it can do it very quickly. Uh, and it can apply a best fit circle, again, using whatever algorithm is best suited for that machine. Uh, and then it can decide how much circularity or cylindricity air that surface has, regardless of where the axis of that feature ended up with respect to whatever you're turning the axis about. So again, very different from uh, run out, but this is kind of a peek behind the scenes as to how those polar probes truly check things like circularity and cylindricity. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to check out our other videos. Our goal is to be your best source for gd and information online. It's important to us that everyone involved in engineering and manufacturing have the chance to learn and better understand gd and on your prints. We have many free resources to help you get started on your learning journey. Subscribe to our gd and community using the link in the description below or visit our website. Test your knowledge with our gd and and print reading quizzes. Download helpful charts and access articles written by training experts.